Wonderful. Cool. So give us just a second. Thank you, everyone, for, for your patience. And it looks like out of the 104 people we had in Airmeet, 90 are already over here. So I think we're in good shape. Let me just see if I can find Andy. Andy is one of the, the good people to, to bring over. <laughs> Get going here in just a second. Okay, well, while we're waiting for, for Andy to join, Vinay, um, perhaps I could do kind of a brief introduction. And uh, if you were able to hear, okay, maybe uh, we could talk a little bit about the, the previous slides on meaning and value, and uh, maybe uh, a bit about our previous conversation. Uh, that, that uh, everything AV wise is perfect now, it's crystal clear. It's great. Perfect, perfect. Well, well, um, I made an introduction of you in Slack that made sure to include not only your history in Ethereum world, but of course, um, with the Department of Defense, uh, with the Hexiert, uh, and ultimately with the cypherpunk movement well, well beyond uh, just Ethereum. Um, and our conversation and, and the syllabus definitely uh, tries to lean heavily upon many of those teachings that are uh, before Ethereum, um, but wanted to also ground today's discussion in you know the here and the now for Ethereum. So, so that's where Angela and William telling us about okay what's going on in ETH1, what's going on with stateless Ethereum, and and ultimately, as we think about this world now that has um, contracts and accounts um, and and less of these disparate server data relationships. Uh, with something like Ethereum actually coming to fruition, uh, be keen to hear you um, and, and ultimately want to thank you for being with us today. Oh, very welcome, very welcome. Um, so where, where would you like to begin? I mean, there's a huge amount of ground we could cover here. Yeah, I think the, um, the first topic uh, that we have um, that was actually kind of the previous slide uh, was was a discussion around this idea that that comes up in unrecognizable capitalism, which I can also pull up just so you have context. Was uh, one of the readings uh, for the week, um, which which was your talk uh, on the promise of blockchains. Um, and ultimately, there's there's kind of an open question around this like new paradigm of data. Um, for for us, uh, the two kind of main topics to, to kick off with might be, what is this new paradigm, uh, very practically speaking? Um, and, and how does it differ from the paradigms, you know, from the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s? And, and what is new about what we're doing here? Um, and, and there is a particular quote from Simon de la Rouvier, who, um, who, who kind of like tried to describe uh, this in, in other words, that we thought had a lot of uh, relation to to the to the video that you shared. So maybe I'll just read it uh, as a as a kicking off point, uh, which was it's doubtful that programs will develop the desire to connect for the sake of it like we do, unless we program them to do so. However, the benefits of knowing that a computation was verifiably done is like inventing religion for programs. With verifiable computing protocols, a program will know the minds of other programs. Unlike biology, it will know exactly the state and processing capability. There's no longer this idea of servers and data and logic connected disparately throughout the network. So uh, Vinay, I think you were one of the first people to like really get this and talk about it uh, early in 2015, 2016. I'd be keen maybe to start here. 
Sure. Um, so with all this stuff, um, it's very easy for us to forget that computers are physical systems. You know, over and over and over again, we go through the building of these abstraction layers, abstraction layers, abstraction layers. But it's easy for us to get, forget that computers are physical systems. So as the physical system of the computer changes, um, so does the uh, technical architecture that wraps around that physical structure. So I, I don't know how many of the folks in the room have used SQL, but SQL has this fundamental construct, which is join and join builds a relation between two tables, one table, two table, right? The join command was a way of driving tape decks. So the data lived on tapes, right? Tape one went into tape machine one, tape two went into tape machine two, and you could only have as many clauses in the join as you had tape machines. And then the way that the SQL kind of backend compiled was it compiled into a set of instructions for the tape machine where you would run tape one forward and then you'd run tape two forward and then you'd run tape one forward and you'd run tape two forward. And that was it working its way through the entire matrix of the data formed by those two axes of computation. And if you say that to modern SQL programmers, do you know that in the old days it was one tape machine per join clause and you just couldn't run the software if you didn't have enough tape machines. They sort of get this look on their face like, what? Right? And then the light kind of goes on like, oh, you know, this is a 50 year old programming paradigm. It's literally 50 years old. So, you know, that notion, right? SQL, tape machines, one big room with a bunch of tape machines in it. And then the programmers kind of surround that 50 year old computing paradigm, 50 year old political paradigm, 50 year old software paradigm, right? You come into the 1980s. The 1980s model is the beginning of internet working. It's modems, it's dial up. Now you have guys in the field on a laptop phoning home and uploading the data. And now you've got this whole network paradigm begins, but it's hub and spoke. There's a thing in the middle. Um, then we come across to where we are right now, no longer this hanging a hub and spoke model. Now, because the network is so strong, we have peer to peer. And the machines at the edges are so interconnected to each other that they no longer need the machine in the middle to do all the connective work. But now what gets you is speed of light delays. So it's whatever it is, uh, I want to say 130 milliseconds to China and back, roughly, from the States. Um, and in that 130 milliseconds, a decent programming system can process, oh, I don't know, a million transactions, right? You know, if you're dealing with something like HFT. So now we have to deal with the fact that the network, although it is incredibly deeply connected in terms of bandwidth, it has hit the hard limit on time. And this is what gives birth to the blockchain. The blockchain is a way of resolving the fact that different parts of the network are irre irreconcilably delayed from each other. And the block is an abstraction to allow us to do synchronization across the network. And you know, the early days of blockchain, everybody would talk about the CAP theorem because the CAP theorem is the computer science way of talking about light speed delay. But the, the entire architecture that we're working inside of is a result of having widely distributed computing inside of a limited speed of light environment. And this is where we are. Yeah, yeah. it reminds me of this. This is specifically from the brief um, in terms of, and, and, and I like the, the words that you use. This is unimaginable strangeness, which, which uh, <laughs> Which we're going to try our best to imagine together here, but but the this distributed database where everywhere that there is data there is a network, and everywhere there is a network there is data. Um, it's it's spread simultaneously. There's the ability to share a, one story of reality. Um, you know, the first thing that came out of this was a central bank for the internet, um, and and that being the the kickoff of what you say is um, many many kind of pieces to come with 2020 and beyond. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this kind of model, right, once we locate the blockchain in the modern physical infrastructure era, you know, it becomes very tightly associated with projects like GPS, you know, GPS uses the speed of light delay to prove where things are on the physical world. So it's still, you know, the nodes in the GPS network are so far apart that the light speed delay allows you to do accurate measurement from where you are to the node. And the physical distance from the nodes is what triangulates your position on the surface of the earth. You know, it's not just the blockchain. 
Google Spanner, the thing that allows you to synchronize on a Google Doc. Google Spanner operates because the Google data centers all have atomic clocks in them, and they know how long the light speed delay is to every other data center. So it allows them to make an estimate of the absolute event horizon when something happened within a seven millisecond window. So all they do is they delay the transactions by seven milliseconds to make sure that they know when everything happened and the whole system runs politely, right? So it, it's not just that the blockchain is this kind of isolated thing like, oh, it's, you know, it's on this cutting edge. Everything in the modern world that we touch digitally is dealing with light speed delay. Even this Zoom call does a whole bunch of computation where it slows down my speech when you hear it to cover the latency between when I stop talking and when you start talking that's imposed by the light speed delay. So it's basically constantly finding a way of eating 20 milliseconds of delay at the end of every sentence. And that's why we're able to talk relatively smoothly because they're constantly managing light speed issues. So this is our paradigm, right? We're in a world where because everything is online and because the network has a speed of light limit, this is the position that we're in. Vinay, uh, I have, you know, light sped in from Africa finally. And uh, yes. one of the uh, first questions that I want to ask you and your wonderful background based on this notion of unimaginable strangeness, the paradigm of light speed within which we operate is, you know, towards the end of this talk, you talk a little bit about Act 2 and 3, and William gave us some insights into what Act 2, some of the shape that it might take. But I wonder if you can begin by speaking perhaps about something that you've called uh, in the past the Internet of Agreements. Hmm, sure. What What is the Internet of Agreements, and how does it tie into this light speed paradigm and the unimaginable strangeness of a central bank on the Internet that everybody can use? Um, you could probably even pull up the Internet of Agreements webpage there. There's a bunch of stuff up there if folks are interested. Um, so the Internet of Agreements is basically a way of thinking about the continuing stepping forward um, of the things that we can represent digitally. Right? So the, kind of the first thing that we represent digitally is letters, you know, email, the, the kind of primal object. You know, you write it on a postcard, you drop it into the computer, the computer sends it for you. Then we begin to work towards hypertext, this new thing, the web, where suddenly these letters are connected to each other because we've given everything a name. Namespace is incredibly important. The first namespace is a namespace for domains, domain names. The second namespace is a namespace for documents, these URLs, right? Um, then the internet comes across images. <clears throat> very early on in the process, we build a way of doing a representation of images. Now we've got images online. Great, that was images. Then we do sound. So what's happening is that we're slowly rolling forward data type by data type, class by class, pulling things into digital form so that we can work with them digitally. Um, uh, audio went from little clips on the web to being the entire kind of galactic library. You know, the Celestial Library, everything is online, 70 million tracks, 10 bucks a month. And eventually we might have to start paying the musicians again or we're going to run out of music, but that's a different problem, right? Um, same thing happened with books, right? Firstly, electronic ordering books, then the Kindle. Now we've got book reading online. So you get to this point where you sort of say, okay, what's next? And the obvious answer is legal documents, legal agreements. So you come to a website, you want to buy some services, it gives you 75 million pages of legal stuff and a button on the bottom that says, I accept. And you go page, 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 click. Well, that's an internet of agreements operation. You've just created a legal obligation on yourself online. You have no idea what you've agreed to. You have no understanding of where you are in this situation. You know, you just assume that you're gonna get the same deal everybody else gets from Google or Amazon or Facebook. And you assume it can't be that bad because everybody's in the same boat. And that's an example of a bad use of Internet of Agreements. Good use of Internet of Agreements might be something like Wonga, where you have a very clear understanding that you're entering into a loan agreement. You slide the bars. It gives you accurate feedback about the deal that you're taking. The deal is horrible. If you weren't willing to take a horrible rule, you wouldn't go to Wonga. Then you borrow the money. So this is conceptually the kind of Internet of Agreements is just this ability to create legally binding contracts online. And then what you say is within that space, how do we get the contracts that we want rather than getting bad contracts? 
you know, how do we assert kind of the power of the individual in that context? Well, one of the things that I really love about this presentation that you gave at Michal Bovens, and one of the reasons that it's in the syllabus is that you provide such a deep history of both computer science as it relates to capitalism and bring them together. And if we go back into the deep history of this notion of the Internet of Agreements, you know, and particularly the cypherpunk version of this history, which is that on that mailing list or the many mailing lists which formed this particular subculture, not only did you have guys like Hal Finney and Wei Dai and Satoshi Nakamoto talking about e-coins or e-dollars or various ways of doing virtual currency, mm -hmm. you also had this other group of people who intimately connected with them, you know, Nick Zabo and Mark Miller and uh, uh, Ian Gregg talking about Ricardian contracts, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the arguments that is often made, particularly around the financial meltdown of 2007, 2008, is that the whole problem conceptually that precipitated everything that happened in those years was that nobody could actually see into these damn contracts that they'd signed on you know, various kinds of swaps or just terrible derivatives full of toxic assets that nobody was actually reading about. And that if there were Ricardian contracts where you could sort of dynamically inspect the contents of any contract and understand in a sort of modelable way uh, the way in which contracts fit together and the way in which uh, we contract one another, you wouldn't have be, we wouldn't have been led into a situation where there was you know, vast amounts of global wealth caught up in contracts that nobody had ever looked at. And I, you know, to me, this seems like it bears great relationship to not only your idea of servers and data and logic everywhere connected in the network, but the collapse of the data and the document paradigms of computing. You know, we're seeing, as you said, you know, Internet of Agreements has been around for a long time, but more and more we're seeing this collapse of the difference between digital agreements and real world agreements. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be meeting in this notion of the Ricardian contract and, and contracts as dynamic objects, not as flat word documents. Uh, and I wonder, you know, what is your experience of this? How does it relate to your work with Materium? Where do you see this going? How far can we take it? Yeah, I mean, it's so when you, when you get into venues where people really do trade. So if you take something like Chicago Border Trade, Chicago Border Trade is where they sell food, basically food, iron ore, aluminium, you know, all the really big sort of deliveries in the hundreds of thousands of tons a year kind of commodities go through Chicago border trade. And that system is extremely electronic. You know, it's all, it's all digital trade. Um, but unless the commodity has gone through a very, very extensive kind of binding to the digital, then you can't buy and sell it in these digital venues. So Fortune 500 stock goes through the whole process of publicly listing. Chicago border trade has to list the commodity. So the current instantiation of the Internet of Agreements is largely inside of regulated exchanges for extremely heavily regulated things, right? Stocks, bonds, commodities. And the, the listing process where a venue decides that it's willing to let people buy and sell the thing, it's very dependent on having a precise technical definition of what the thing is which is being bought and sold. So... Right now, it's not that we're not in a world which has an internet of agreements. It's that the internet of agreements is really business to business rather than peer to peer. Could you bring up the web page for Chicago Board of Trade just so people can get a quick sense of what that's about? Sure. Um, now, what we're really changing in the in with the blockchain is that the blockchain is a peer to peer system. So we take the kind of internet of agreements as it currently lives inside of Chicago Board of Trade and we break that open so it can cover anything, right? So the ICO world is what happens when you break open the exchanges for uh, um, uh, commercial rights in companies, right? I give you some money to start a company, you give me some tokens, I sell the tokens on an exchange. It's the same basic machinery as you would get if you were doing something like crowdfunding a company, but now you can exchange the tokens that you've got in the crowdfund. Now, that model of blowing open the exchanges, it first happened to a limited degree because we were in the age where all of these things only traded inside of exchanges. Then the regulators come and begin to regulate the exchanges and companies won't do business in America and all the rest of this stuff. More and more pressure builds up. 
then we get the golden age of decentralized exchanges, Uniswap. And, you know, here, I got to admit, like, I miss Uniswap. I took a look at it. I'm like, really? Is that cool? And about three months later, it hit me like a hammer, like, oh, my God, they've done it. You know, and it, it, it really was remarkable because it's like I'm nearly 50 and you think like, yeah, you know, I still got it. I'm still right on top of this. And the fact that it took me three months to realize what I was looking at when I looked at Uniswap is hilarious. It's like, oh boy, right? First sign of getting old, ha, <laughs> right? But once it clicked, suddenly the world opens up. All things are possible. Um, and that process, right, that works for financial instruments, right? Whatever these tokens are, they're financial instruments. We've now got a decentralized exchange for financial instruments. Next step, what if we do a decentralized exchange for physical things? And this is kind of the project, the progression, right? Shall we, um, shall we kill the screen share? So I think that's the last thing we need to look at. Maybe we'll bring up the Materium stuff later on. So, you know, that transitional moment where, you know, all of a sudden this is, this is like, you know, decentralization hits the physical trade game. That's kind of the next horizon, I think. And this, you know, bears great kind of relevance to the argument that's constructed in module one, which is that, you know, since kind of time immemorial, in fact, the curated material start with one of Nick Zalbo's old posts about the Plato protocols and sealing and their, you know, sort of the significance of that in terms of tamper-proof evidence and stuff, right? And, and one of the arguments that I'm trying to build in that is that, you know, ever since the development of writing and, and money is a technology that goes before writing, if we listen to Andreas Antonopoulos, but ever since the development of writing, the record of mythic stories around which society coheres and the record in which we store our debts to one another, they have, they're made up of the same symbols, but they're separate things. And somebody controls this record of debts and that you know, incentivizes everybody else to try and manipulate them and it gives them great power. Whereas with the development of Bitcoin and this sort of new kind of economic narrative network, the, the record in which we record the order of transaction and who owes what who to whom and the mythic record are kind of in very interesting ways collapsed. And, you know, you talk in, 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 in this talk that's in the syllabus, you, know, you say it's really important to go and read some cypherpunk sci-fi as tough as it may be, because you have to understand this technology in a mythic sense. Mm. Uh, you know, and I wonder, you know, in terms particularly of stories help us navigate the physical world, physical goods are increasingly becoming digitized and tradable online. What, how does myth fit into how we navigate the, you know, digitalization of, of physical goods and, and the next step of, codification of you know trade and, and value mm. as, as it applies to human relationship yeah so um i guess i mean let's take an example object right here is a gold bangle you know now for this to have value there are two ways for this thing to acquire value right the first is i can present it with the receipt and I can say, this receipt refers to this object. I bought it in this place at this time. Trust me, it's gold. Right? And that's the kind of transaction that might happen over something like eBay, where I don't have physical access to the thing. I just have to believe the story that you present me about the thing. Right? Track one. Track two, I walk into a pawnbroker. They don't give a monkeys about the receipt. They don't need any data. They don't need anything. They just rub it on a sort of abrasive surface and then they drop some acid onto it and if the stuff dissolves it's not gold thank you very much for playing and if the stuff doesn't dissolve it is gold and they'll buy it after they weigh it simple as that so there are usually two tracks you can look at what is absolutely true or you can look at the narrative and the narrative is smooth and clean and easy to digitize but the physical truth is much harder to digitize and if we want to digitize the physical truth of this thing, right? You know, we take it over, we take it to the place where they do the acid test. You've heard the term acid testing something. The acid test is the test for gold. So they perform the acid test. They then write down the result, put the thing in a tamper resistant bag, seal it with your Play-Doh protocol, and then hand it back to me. Well, now something interesting has happened. 
because I can now say this object in this bag is referred to by this document, and now I can put that fact online. If the thing that turns up in your post box is in that bag and has this thing in it, then you know that this thing is made of gold. So what we're doing here is we're building evidential locks, just like the wax seals or the clay seals that Nick Sabo talks about. We're building evidential locks between the physical and the digital as a way of giving physical things transferable digital identities, right? We have the ability to slide this backwards and forwards in a way that we didn't before. And, you know, this is the Materium story, the Materium vision, is that if we build a robust architecture for binding together the physical ground truth about things with the narrative, once you can make that tie and you can lock it, you can then move physical objects around by their stories. And then when you finally get to the point where you need physical settlement, somebody just takes the thing, drops it in a box and FedExes it. But it could trade many, many, many times, you know, as a property right, not tied to the physical delivery before you take physical delivery. And I want to, you know, because I think that this is amazing. It's a vision that I share and, and feel, you know, quite personally inspired by it. So I want to push you a little bit on, you know, for me, one of the important uh, drives in trying to understand some of the myths that are in the programmers' minds as they're making this stuff is mm. to push further into like, what are the implications of if, if we can get these evidential locks right? Uh, you know, one of the points that Zabo makes in, in, in that post is that faith and finance are intimately linked, right? There is this, you know, kind of curse around breaking the seal because it has these you know, moralistic and financial and, you know, in those times, religious uh, implications. Uh, there is a particular kind of myth around uh, the evidential luck and also the implications that it has uh, for society either when it's broken, but also in terms of keeping it uh, intact. Mm -hmm. So like in terms of the myth, right? What are the implications of being able to get these evidential locks right in the digital world such that you can begin to really trade stories at scales? Mm -hmm. It's difficult to imagine. So where we are right now is that we're in the process of killing the world. And, you know, I don't think anybody that's looking at the news has a strong way of denying that. We're killing the world. We started when we started building nuclear weapons. And then we've accelerated right the way through the age of oil and coal. And now we're looking at nanotech, biotech, and a whole bunch of new potential X-risk things that are rapidly piling up, including, of course, our good old friend AI. Right? So why is it that the human race is in the process of killing the world? How did that happen? Answer. Arr. And we just kind of look at each other. Like, I don't know. Did you kill the world? I didn't kill the world. He's kind of killing the world. Why are you doing right? And, you know, you sort of get to this point where everybody's pointing the finger at everybody else. Because at the end of the day, we don't think of having this call as burning gas. Right? I, I recently saw some statistics saying that an hour on uh, video calling was the same as driving something like three miles. Right? I don't know if that's accurate or not. I haven't seen the data. Um, but, you know, this was the kind of headline that came out, you know, burns an eighth of a gallon of gas an hour video conferencing. It's like, oh, you know, you don't like to think of like, this call might be actually a substantial emitter of carbon, but a lot of computation is happening to make this happen. So because we don't see the downstream impacts of the actions that we take, a whole bunch of stuff washes off the edge of our awareness. And in the areas where we're paying no attention, problems grow, problems breed, right? Similarly, you know, nanotech, biotech, all this X risk stuff, all of it's building up in places where the people who are doing it are not paying any attention to the impacts in the far future. Same thing with nukes, you know? The people building the nuclear weapons think of short range, oh, we're protecting our system of government, it's just part of the defense agenda. They're not thinking nuclear we uh, winter, they're not thinking nuclear induced climate change. They're not thinking radiological contamination. They're just not thinking, right? So my feeling is that what we've created around us is a position where the narrative that we're embedded in is simply an enormous woven tissue of lies, some of which were told to us by religion, some of which were told to us by government, some of which were told to us by other kinds of power holders, and some of which were told to us by advertisers. And 
for me, the fundamental purpose of the blockchain is to take an enormous, big, sharp sword and slice completely through the tissue of lies. So that when we're done, nobody makes an important decision based on a lie or based on a myth that does not bind to reality. And that's a world where we survive because nobody wants to kill the world. We're killing the world because we're making decisions based on this mythic bullshit that's been drawn over our eyes. And when you slice that off, people will start making decisions in a rational way. You know, it's not that people are crazy, it's that their heads are filled with nonsense. And that's a different thing from being crazy. If you replace the nonsense with wisdom, they will very rapidly stop acting in these ways. Like this whole QAnon thing that's gone down in the States, the QAnon thing happened in America because people had bad data, right? They weren't bad people, they were good people with bad data. Once you've got the bad data, you get bad actions. So, you know, what the blockchain gives us is a way of nailing the truth down. And that's my narrative, right? You know, here's the myth. The myth is the world is being destroyed by lies and cheats and myth that is rooted in nothing. We go through and we systematically replace the lies with truth, and you're going to get a better world inevitably mechanically as a result. It's almost likeness of the modern era. Yeah, it's wonderful. I, uh, I want to take even a further step because you know, I think this is wonderful and it does bear a relation. You know, the anthology that you mentioned at the end of this particular talk is Mirror Shades as a mm. kind of introductory step into some of the wonderful world of cyberpunk fiction. And the first story in that is written by a man called William Gibson. It's the Gernsback Continuum, which is kind of his first. Uh, Such a good you know, story. It's a wonderful story. I mean, semiotic ghosts is a whole conversation for a different time, perhaps. But I want to, you know, a feature of cypherpunk fiction is precisely this kind of alienation that you pointed at. The fact that we are destroying the world, the fact that nobody seems to be co completely irresponsible, the fact that there is no coherent uh, grounds from which to operate. Uh, and yet, it's, it's, it's interesting to me, because as I was thinking about this, you know, alienation is a, is a sort of perhaps the uh kind of motif of cypherpunk fiction and yet the blockchain is about shared truth it's about establishing common grounds for funding common goods you know it's it's i i wasn't quite sure how the you know this mythic motif of alienation as instantiated in cypherpunk has resulted in a technology at seeming polar opposites to that? Is it, is it because opposites always go together and that people were reacting to what they saw as the negative parts of cyberpunk fiction, trying to avoid some of those dystopias? Or how is it that you see this uh, you know, common ground for nailing these unassailable facts to the mast and cutting through some of the mythic crap? So the Ethereum community has completely forgotten one of the fundamental truths of cryptography. Right. The community as a whole has amnesia about this in the worst possible way, right? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to restress this. Ethereum has an enormous collective amnesia about one of the fundamental truths of cryptography, which is, right, nobody ha can know what physical human controls which cryptographic key if you want protection from the operations of the governments. Right? Now, that fundamental truth was completely understood in the 1990s. Nobody can know your key. There's Werner Vinge, Vinga? I don't know how to pronounce his name because I've only ever read it. Werner Vinge has a book called True Names, right? And True Names is specifically about what happens when you try and figure out whose keys go with which people. Now, this notion that the cryptographic key is a proxy identity that lives in cyberspace you perform actions using this proxy identity, but your physical identity and the proxy identity are never connected. This is an axiomatic truth of cyberpunk. And you do that because the cyberspace world, you want it to operate by its own rules and not by the rules of the nation states. Because cyberspace, oh, there's a cracking old word, right? Cyberspace exists de facto globally under the jurisdiction of the network operators. Right? You know, there is a single global network. It's created by a whole bunch of telcos working together. And cyberspace is de facto under the jurisdiction of the telcos. If the telcos take the traffic away, 
that thing drops out of cyberspace and no longer exists. Encryption then stops the telcos inspecting the messages which are traveling over their networks, which means the telcos lose the ability to control what happens in cyberspace. Then cyberspace becomes private and regulated only by software. Now, do you see how that chain of logic is very simple and very clear and very obvious, but we've totally missed it out in our blockchain modeling? Right? Everybody is going around with bright, shiny, identifiable human beings associated with token projects, which are illegal in half of the jurisdictions where the token is being sold because the token is being sold on Uniswap. Right? And from the perspective of the old school cypherpunks, you know, this is like watching a bunch of people running around in clown suits on a battlefield filled with machine guns. Right? Hey, we're over here. We're totally breaking the law. You can't catch us. <laughs> right? And the only re reason that this has happened is because the US regulatory system shut down for four years under Donald Trump. Right? Spring of 2001, President Obama goes to South by Southwest. And he says, we cannot have ordinary Americans with Swiss bank accounts in their pockets because eventually it's going to make things like collecting taxes difficult. Right? We're going to have to have a negotiation with the industry about how we stop this happening because this stuff is really an existential threat to the way that the US functions. Now, that's President Obama. And this is not even a prepared speech. This is him making a bunch of off-the-cuff comments. La, 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 la. Here we are having a little chat about this. And what that implies is that the President of the United States had been briefed in on the tax starvation argument, which was one of the fundamental arguments from the early days of Bitcoin. Right? And this is the real situation that we are in. Right? We've had a four-year window because the US government has been out to lunch. Already, Right? Treasury Secretary, I think it was the Treasury Secretary, who just came in is saying, hey, this cryptocurrency thing, this is a real problem. We're going to have to do something about this. So you know, it's very, very important for us to not get high on our own supply when it comes to myth-making about what crypto is, right? And the Ethereum community is dreadfully high on its own supply when it comes to understanding the legal status of what we're doing and the need for not forming simple, easy ties between people and their cyberspace identities. Because if you have a simple tie between this cryptographic key and this human being through, for example, people verifying identity exchanges, you make it very easy for the cyberspace bubble to come crashing down in an agonizing series of lawsuits, as you are, for example, seeing with Ripple right now. Is everybody clear on this? So, you yeah, know, I think that's, uh, it's, it's wonderful to have a uh, more seasoned perspective. Uh, you know, it's appropriately paranoid because, you know, like, let us not forget that Bitcoin acquired value initially because Julian Assange's Operation WikiLeaks, which was fighting the government with all that they had at that point, was blockaded from receiving funds from Visa. So the libertarians started buying Bitcoin to send it to Assange, who then sold the Bitcoin to fund WikiLeaks. And that's where Bitcoin first became useful. Right? The reason Bitcoin has such a strong libertarian fringe is because it was all the people that were buying Bitcoin to support WikiLeaks that really gave we uh, Bitcoin its initial value. And that's less than 10 years ago, remember. This is very, very, very recent. Right? Because it's just before most Ethereum people start his think history starts in 2014, you know, that stuff is kind of forgotten. Like, oh, year zero, 2015, the blockchain goes live. No, 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 no. Right? Ethereum dropped into an existing war. And I do mean war, right? WikiLeaks, as you can see from what happened to Julian Assange, WikiLeaks was directly in the targets of a war on people understanding their governments, right? It's a very, very fundamental problem. So, you know, we need to understand that the kind of Ethereum, and I'm, I just, I can't say this too clearly, right? The Ethereum house culture, Ethereum's tribal culture, has a bunch of myths in it, and those myths are stupid just stupid and dangerous you know we have to remember where we are located in objective reality we have to be much more clinical about the legal risks we have to be much more clinical about the technical risks and you may notice that a lot of these DeFi tokens which are currently floating around there is no visible team right these things are issued anonymously and there's a reason for that yeah yeah um Vinay, just to 
kind of dive deep there because I think it's important. There was a very explicit question on what's the roadmap for legally enforceable smart contracts. And just oh, yeah. so that you have some of the other questions, there's been probably like four or five great ones. Yeah, sure, sure. As, um, we were, as, we, as we were going through these evidential locks, there was a question from Rebecca around um, the, the implicit uh, tie between codification and tokenization and how so let's, how do these one, let's do these one at a time. Smart contracts, right? There is no way to make a smart contract legally enforceable unless a court says it's legally enforceable. Right, step one. So your high path is a jurisdiction like Wyoming says smart contracts are contracts. Courts will consider them as contracts. It's a contract. Knock yourself out. Right? And if the law says that, you can make the case easily. If the law doesn't say that, you can make an argument that it's an implicit contract and you can figure it out it'll be fine. Then you get this problem of what about in jurisdictions where you don't want to roll the dice on that? <clears throat> How do you approach it? And the answer is you take a paper contract, you and I sign a contract, right? I agree that I will give you uh, one metal horseshoe if the price of ether is above 35 cents on Tuesday, right? There's the contract on paper, then it says, and we are going to agree by inspecting the following on-chain oracle that will tell us the price of Ether, and that's how we'll make the decision. That goes in the contract. Right? Now we have a contract where the paper contract that we have signed refers to a technical system to implement part of the contract. Very, very, very simple. Right? Now, that contract, if there's a dispute, has to go to court. And the problem that we will have in that position is the judge might still be an idiot. But the contract very clearly says this technical system will make the decision. And the judge is like, I don't hold none of this technology. I don't even have Facebook. Check. Right? And if that happens, you're talking about going to appeal courts and the cost of enforcement goes through the roof and the entire thing is a nightmare. So instead, <clears throat> the contract that we have specifies that under the terms of the 1958 New York Convention on Foreign Arbitral Awards, in the event of a dispute, we will hire a judge out of our own pockets and that judge will make the decision, and we will select the judge from a list of judges that's maintained by a specific professional body. And this construct where you privately select a judge is completely standard in commercial law. This is used all the time by builders and people making uh, in commercial real estate, boat building, oil rigs, any kind of serious heavy industry. They'll use these kind of arbitration courts because you don't want to try and treat concrete engineering or maritime welding to a judge before he can do a dispute, right? You want these people to come with the knowledge in bed. So what this creates is the Ricardian contract framework invented by my friend Ian Grigg. <clears throat> and for context, I bought 100% gold backed anonymous digital cash from Ian in probably 2000. Gives you a notion of how far back this goes. So where this puts us is we have a paper contract, we both agreed. It specifies an arbitrator, it specifies a technical system. The final trick here is that digital signatures are signatures in law since about 2000 in essentially all countries. So although we say paper contract, that paper contract can exist as a text online on a web server, and we can then apply digital signatures to that contract as a way of signing it. So though we say paper contract when we talk about recording contracts, because the digital signatures legislation makes a contract signable by a digital signature, we can now use a digital signature on an English text to invoke an arbitrator and to specify terms both in the normal court and in the uh, software system. And this binding together, it's a whole bunch of moving parts and this is what Materium initially existed to do, right? The first edition of Materium was, we're going to run the arbitration court and provide the standardized contracts so that the entire Ethereum space can make their smart contracts legally binding. And we were ready to do that in 2018, and we were so much too early that we had to pivot very hard to taking that very powerful machinery and applying it to disputes over physical objects. So this whole thing that Materium talks about, like digital identities for physical things, we're going to be publishing a bunch of gold brick NFTs and probably we're aiming for the end of this month. 
might slip into next month, but we're aiming for the end of this month. Gold bricks in vaults under smart contracts, you can move them around. Very, very simple, very clear, very discreet, buyable on rareable, buyable on open sea, and then there'll be a whole bunch of other stuff that comes out behind that. All of that digital identities for physical things stuff is just a, a way of taking this entire arbitration court machinery and turning it into a product that people can figure out how to buy. Did that make sense? I feel like I went into tons of detail there. Totally, yeah. And I'm excited for those to come out on Rareables then. Yeah, yeah it's going to be it's going to be a ton of fun, right? Because now you're finally in a position where you know you 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 buy an NFC from me, uh, an NFT rather. You buy an NFT from me. You know, we'll go own a gold brick in Singapore. You give the NFT to somebody else. Now they own a gold brick in Singapore. Right? You know, you walk up to the guys who have physical custody of the gold and say, "Hey, I got this NFT." Could you sell the gold brick and then wire me the money and they'll do it? Mm-hmm. You, know, you can even turn up in Singapore and they'll physically hand you a brick. How cool is that? Mm-hmm. Right? And the, the Shatner stuff will be coming out right around the same time, probably two weeks later. And then after that, we're off to the races. And you know, imagine how cool it's going to be when you've got things like hackathons. And you know, the hackathon has like 50 physical items which are tied to NFTs that are being bought and sold and traded by the contracts that are used in the hackathon. You know, by the time we get to the big Ethereum conventions later this year, I'm hoping that we will have smart property for things like lunar laptops. You know, somebody brings a couple of extra laptops, you issue an NFT on the laptop, somebody needs a laptop because their laptop is currently feeling poorly, bing, you buy the NFT, you pick up the laptop. This kind of thing is all completely possible. Awesome. Awesome. Um, I think it'll be fun, right? Go through, so Vinay, I know we, we, I'm not sure how much time you have. There's probably like 15 questions in the chat. Maybe we can. Yeah, yeah I can, I can, I can run over. I got time. I don't have another call for, yeah, I got, I got half. Okay. Okay, cool. I'll pass the mic around to some of the folks who have been posting the chat, starting with Rebecca from Zeria, if, uh, if you want to kick off. Yeah. Hey, Vinay. So my question is around, like you talked about how the myths that drive Ethereum and DeFi and basically this new digital space that we're building are sometimes very, very distant from objective reality. I think one of those realities is just environmental destruction, Mm. as well as um, injustices to millions and perhaps billions of people that just, whose lives are totally outside of what we're building here. And I sense a real tension both within DeFi and, and just the space in general between this kind of this push to codify everything, to tokenize everything. You see this happening um, amongst creators, amongst businesses, um, and commodification in a world that is really run by financial markets. And I think it was Sebnem in the chat who mentioned that these injustices only exist because we're able to separate ourselves from them. So how do you reconcile this tension between commodification and separation? Because to me, it often just looks like a reinforcing feedback loop. Boom. I just wrote a book about this called The Future of Stuff. Right Now, the reason that book exists is specifically to try and fight against this tendency for commodification to equal abstraction away of consequences. Um, and weirdly enough, I think that's the only thing that I've ever written where you know I signed a contract and there is copyright and I didn't just put it on the internet. Um, And I did that specifically because I wanted kind of the credibility that comes with a publisher and a paper book and all the rest of that stuff. I want the damn thing read. So this is a slightly indirect approach, but I am going to talk very directly about what you're talking about in a second. But first, we've got to talk about lettuce and food poisoning. So if you buy a salad in a store and you get food poisoning they have to do a recall and they have to figure out where the lettuce came from, how it got contaminated and what else is contaminated. And how it got contaminated is really critical because it could have been contaminated in the factory where it was processed or it could have been contaminated in the farm where it was grown. So in order to do a food safety recall, you have to have a map all the way back to the beginning of where the thing was in the ground and you have to know who grew it. So if you go back and you discover that this food was grown in Guatemala and the problem was that it was grown in a farm in an area that had a cholera outbreak and that's how you wind up with cholera in your lettuce in San Francisco, you know, 
that's a really serious problem, right? And to resolve that problem in trade terms, it turns out that you have to know everything there is to know about the process that put the goods onto the plate, because when something goes wrong in that supply chain, you need to be able to backtrack. So first world consumer rights to know what is in their food and where it came from and the ability to do product recalls implies the documentation of most of what you need to do workers' rights right the way back through that process. The problem is that these things are held in separate databases, right? All of every step on that chain of accountability to tell us where was this food grown is stored inside of a separate database. And because those databases are private rather than public, the companies that are doing this simply keep the information secret until a product recall forces them to get to disclose it. If you start moving this stuff onto a blockchain, so I as a consumer say, hey, I'm not going to buy this lettuce unless the tracking is on a chain and unless I can expect that chain, right? I just won't buy it. Then at this point, my selfish interest in making sure that my food is safe and your worker interest in saying, you know, we demand that we have appropriate rights and we're going to document the fact that we're working for $2 a day growing food for these guys in San Francisco. The data that you require for product safety is also the data that workers require to be able to campaign for better work, working standards. Right? And this is a new horizon. Right? The trajectory that I want to push us onto is a trajectory where consumers unionize in exactly the same way that workers unionized 100 years ago. So if 1% of the people that have Apple products are members of a union that puts $10 a month into a bucket per person, and that money is used to force Apple to do what Apple is supposed to do by lawsuit, by campaign, by advertising, by litigation, by technical analysis, then you wind up in a position where Apple will very soon not be producing components in Chinese factories where people are regularly committing suicide because the consumer union directly locks on to the Apple databases about where everything comes from and says we're going to mount a lawsuit where we subpoena for that information because we are not willing to buy products which are made by slave labor and if you don't disclose we won't buy you know two million people will switch to Android next week unless you do this and all these people were going to buy an iPhone you begin to move enough money around that they will have to pay attention and if we don't start constraining the power of corporations by unionization of consumers there is no effect or counterbalance to corporate power and the biden administration is talking about appointing a very very high level antitrust um uh, officer so there's a notion that the biden might make antitrust litigation a core platform for the next four years but they're also in a position where they owe silicon valley a bunch of favors for ga gagging donald trump so there's a very delicate balance here D did that answer your question does that get to what you wanted to talk about Somewhat, yeah. I obviously have lots of follow-up questions, but I want to respect other people's time. Um, so let me talk about the environmental part of that as well, right? The gold bars that we're going to start selling as NFTs in a couple of weeks will also come with the option of buying carbon offsets at the rate of one ton per ounce, because that's roughly how much CO2 is emitted. So you, as the person buying one of these bars, have the option of buying only a bar which is carbon offset or buying the offset for the bar that you're about to buy. And then you can pass that on to the next person who buys it from you. <clears throat> you know, gold is an ugly product to start with, right? It's a terrible thing in so many ways, right? But it has such incredibly tightly defined properties that it's easy to get into smart contracts. That paradigm of we figure out how much damage the product does and then we offer offsets against the damage. This is going to be a core part of the material uh, story because my background is environmental as well as military. And so there's a real you know, concept that we can basically use. You know, I, I don't want to be naive and say the data will magically open itself, but a combination of consumer pressure plus leading by example from smaller brands could create the incentive structure necessary to force the big companies to modify what they're doing. And that's basically the trajectory that I'm you know, attempting to steer us onto. Um, we could also have a long conversation about land rights, and maybe we should come back to that towards the end if there's time and we could talk about Hernando de Soto, the mystery of capital and what he has right and what he has wrong and how all that plays out. Okay. We have thought about it. <laughs>
<laughs> cool, cool. I want to pass the mic to William, and then we have a couple other questions in the chat, uh, or a couple of people who wanted to ask questions before maybe we, we tend towards wrapping. William, are you? Yeah. Up? Um, so if we're talking about especially the narratives of the bridging of the physical and the digital, and especially with your skills in describing the processes that have emerged in the digital world uh, in order to bring processes of transaction and communication online, Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask you if you think that we're starting to see kind of an existential threat to the nation state model from the sort of big tech fiefdoms that are arising now. So big tech fiefdoms, you're thinking here, Google and those guys. Most likely, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, wow. Okay. So here again, unfortunately, I have to start with a weird perspective, which is the nation state hasn't meaningfully existed since about 1948. Uh, so my contention would be that there are only about 11 countries in the world, and those are the countries with nuclear bombs and everything else is basically a province. Um, and that as a starting position makes it much clearer to what the relationship is between the big tech stacks and the nation state right? because <clears throat> you know if you think of like the american hegemony right google is an instrument of american state power um do you guys all know what a national security letter is nsls so a national security letter is a letter which can be presented to you as the employee of a company and it says give us the following information don't tell anybody and if you open your mouth you're going to jail for 100 million years and this is how groups like the NSA get the private keys out of companies like Google so that they can walk around inside of those systems as if they own them, which they do. This is the real situation. So the nation states which are getting squashed by the big tech platforms, those are the nation states which are not nuclear. They don't have heavy intelligence services. To all intents and purposes, they've already lost sovereignty because they're only able to maintain sovereignty by virtue of cozying up to one of the nuclear powers. So in the EU, France and, German, uh, France and Germany are the nuclear powers. Germany does not officially have nuclear weapons. They have what are called screwdriver ready nukes. So if the Germans need to start making nuclear bombs, they can get them off a production line in somewhere between 30 and 90 days, depending on who you ask. Um, and so, <clears throat> you know, the big powerful nuclear powers, the kind of de facto superpowers, those guys are in no danger from the tech platforms. They're in no danger from the tech platforms at all. And then the tech platforms go out and beat up the smaller states on behalf of the bigger states and the bigger states plead deniability. Oh, we've got no control of Google. They're a private company. That doesn't stop you reading the world's email. No, of course not. We're the NSA. That's our job. You, you see what I'm saying? Like, it's an illusion that the nation states are being pushed around by the big tech companies. It's just a convenient way of the actual real states hiding their power. I, I definitely do hear your point, and I definitely understand the model that you're giving for the four nation states. But um, I know personally, I sort of can't help but wonder, um, the American government is marvelously fragmented, and your points about the NSA are inassailable. But I wonder if we're seeing such a lack of tech savviness from the American government in particular, but I also believe from others that for instance sort of the watershed moment of twitter banning trump and things like that have shown that even though america can ask big tech for help at some point it's not going to be them kicking big tech around it's going to be them looking for a handout from big tech do you do you think that that's a possibility no right okay america has wound up in a position where it was beholden to corporate interests several times before most of it with railroad companies so railroad telegraph and a couple other instances you wind up with near monopoly holders of power because they control physical infrastructure like the railroads. And you do certainly get a point where they begin to become quite strong and they begin to push the state around a little. And then at some point, the state kind of rocks back on its heels and it's like, Bob, have you had enough of those guys? I've had enough of those guys. We need to get these guys back under control. And at that point, the state figures out how to restore the balance. So remember when Bell Telephone got carved up with antitrust? Right. Antitrust is basically how the US government controls 
too big for their own boots corporate actors that looks like a monopoly and our job is to regulate monopolies chop 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 and if they were looking at apple for example they might split the laptop business from the app store business from the phone business and at that point what has apple become it's three separate companies with three separate product lines and all of the integration which is so much the apple brand or they cut off the cloud company as well all that integration would suddenly be back to standard commercial contract and if it looks like those companies were colluding you would do them again but this time for cartels right the, the state has lavish power it just usually doesn't use the power until the problem is really, really bad. And then, bam, and everything changes. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that it is, I think it's very clear that big tech is approaching the point where it's about to get the kicking. Um, antitrust law is the usual instrument of choice for doing this stuff. They did it to the banks, they did it to the railroads. They did it to the Telegraph guys, if I remember correctly. I don't remember the details of the Telegraph thing. It's a relatively routine operation. Every 30 or 50 years, the US government takes a sledgehammer to the industry, which is causing it pain. And maybe big tech's time is here. Maybe big tech's time isn't here. <clears throat> the reason that big tech, by the way, is so vulnerable is because they haven't succeeded in taking over the Democratic Party. So if big tech had been massive donors to the Democratic Party in a consistent way for the last 15 years, right, then in all probability, you would have wound up as somebody like Beto O'Rourke as president rather than Joe Biden. And Beto O'Rourke used to be a hacker by the name of Psychedelic Warlord, and is allegedly the guy that named Cult of the Dead Cow. And that's about as hardcore a credential as you can get for somebody, you know, of that generation in tech. But because Silicon Valley says, ah, oh, you know, we're not really interested in politics except libertarian politics, screw the nation state, they're just winding up to get slapped down. Whereas if they had basically bought themselves support by helping fund a presidency, the president that was elected on Silicon Valley money is not then going to carve them up with antitrust. But Silicon Valley refused to play the game. Silicon Valley is now extraordinarily vulnerable. And we'll see which way the Biden administration takes that game. One more, uh, maybe series from Irvin Carden, uh, who you're welcome to unmute. Hi, Vinay, thank you. Uh, thank you for your talk today. I just wanted to follow up on a question about uh, the roadmap for smart contracts. And uh, I wanted to get your cypherpunk uh, opinion on this. I think for the past few years, there's been a, a lot of uh, legal, legal projects that are trying to integrate into blockchain smart contracts. Uh, but, you know, given that human law is highly complex, not universal, and can be represented differently across by different parties, you know, hence the need for lawyers, uh, should, do you feel that should human, uh, human law be rewritten to fit the smart contract paradigm of self-executing, self-enforceable agreements, or should we actually build sort of these libraries and frameworks that retrofit or wrap human law into smart contracts as some of these projects are, are doing? So, um, let me reason by analogy here. So there's an acute difference between um, a shack in the woods and an operating theater. You know, these are both places where a human being works. One of them is a largely uncontrolled environment. It's dirty, it's chaotic, there are mice, there are rats, and what you're doing in there is, let's say, carving sculptures with a chainsaw, right? Surgery, every single physical object inside of an operating theater you know, is an enumerated object that is put into that theater under contract. Everything has a clear legal definition of what it should do and shouldn't do. And if something goes wrong, somebody gets sued, right? You know, the scalpel is defective. The swab is contaminated. You know, the surgeon forgot to take off the wristwatch. No physical thing is allowed in that operating theater that has not gone through a kind of uh, 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 a process of restriction, right? So, human law as it normally exists applies in the street chaotic uncontrolled environments nobody really knows what's going on you know court cases are decided largely probabilistically because the evidence usually sucks and you you basically roll the dice and on average it comes out well enough your society can function right we can't take computers and put them into that situation and not get a disaster it's never going to happen right the place where the smart contracts belong is in the operating theater right in the highly controlled environments, you know, aerospace, aviation, medicine, uh, certain aspects of global trade, um, banking, 
those are all the instances where this stuff very, very tightly binds to an already controlled environment. It's a good fit for software. In the woods, in the wilderness, on the streets, it's a terrible fit for software. And if we try, we're largely going to fail. Uh, somebody pointed on the chat whether the judges had lunch or not. The statistics on uh, acquittal rates for crimes and parole hearings and all the rest of this stuff, how this is affected by whether the judges had lunch, whether it's Friday, these numbers are terrifying. In medicine, uh, I want to say a third greater chance of some kind of medical incident if the surgery happens on the doctor's birthday. And the lesson is just never, ever, ever, they just don't let surgeons operate on their birthdays. But you can't ban Friday, and Friday also has hugely elevated risk in hospitals. So, you know, we need to start taking this stuff seriously because these things are the core facts of human performance. I don't know what to do about it, but yeah, these things are absolutely there. Um, did that make sense in terms of answering your actual question? It, it definitely did. Uh, I think I just, a lot of the projects currently they're trying to do this, they still re really need to analyze the space and where, as you mentioned, smart contracts really fit into. And, you know, personally, I also feel that social, mm -hmm. social agreements uh, might not as bind directly to smart contracts. Oh, no, they don't, they don't bind at all. I mean, they, I've never understood why anybody is bothering with DAOs. Right? I, I just can't figure out what problem it is that a DAO is attempting to fix, except in the narrow instances where people are doing things like controlling financial regulation using a committee that votes. You know, like we, we sort of have this weird idea of like DAOs are somehow going to support a kind of new utopian tribal culture. I'm just not, I just haven't made the connection. It could be something like Uniswap where I'm just looking at it, it hasn't gone click yet. The name, yeah. If you, want, if you want to stay here all day, we can continue down this train. <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot to discuss there for sure. Um, so I want to round out one more thing about the smart contracts and wall thing. Um, when huge amounts of value exist in pure digital forms, and I'm talking here about music, uh, film, copyright, licenses, but also potentially things like mortgages, college loans, deeds, right? you do wind up in a position where these pure digital forms of property have increasingly massive impacts on people's lives. So inevitably, you know, as these things get represented more and more perfectly digitally, you wind up with more and more and more need to say, hey, their database has an error and that went over here through an Oracle and that went over here and that went into this risk pool and that's why I just lost my house. And now I'm gonna litigate because this is a technical error it's inevitable that we're going to see more and more and more litigation about the function of software systems. And that is really where smart contracts come into their own because it's the software system that has the absolutely min most minimized risk of error. Makes sense. Thank you very much. Yeah. And yeah, if you guys want to do more of this sometime, you know, it, it does not cause me any stress at all to sit around and talk about this stuff. I always add these things with a clearer understanding of my own thinking that I started with. <laughs> So, you know, it's good for me. If you want to do more of this, just give me a shout. We will indeed. If the chat has any um, implication, I think everyone has, has really enjoyed it. Uh, I wanted to maybe pass the mic to Andy to, to close out if there's anything on his side. Um, and we will definitely, of course, have you back, Vinay. It means a lot that you're here. Yeah, just to echo that, you know, thank you so much for taking the time. And the other big kind of thread that runs throughout the whole of Kernel is the ability to put one's own perspective, opinion, and ego aside and have an open-minded conversation with people from across the spectrum who have various different views, various different experiences, and to consistently seek those who will push you into the discomfortable places that open, you know, really kind of meaningful, profound, and shifting conversations, which I think is something that you certainly provide, Vinay. And not only will we grab some copies of that new book, which hovered digital-like in front of your amazing screen. But, uh... <laughs> if you are looking at this thing, for God's sake, write a review. It's been out for months at this point. And it doesn't have a single review on Amazon. Oh, right? there we go. Plenty of people say they like it, but nobody seems to be willing really to review it. So please write me a review. We have your back there. Wonderful, okay. wonderful. Last thing for, for folks in Colonel, the kind of like three big updates where we're at. Um, we have a new Slack channel on adventure updates. It's very much optional, but preferred if you have kind of gotten to a, a next stage in your adventure. Folks like Vinay and 
uh, 50 other kernel mentors are going to be joining us on Slack. And those updates help us a lot in just putting the pieces together on uh, which conversations might be valuable to you ultimately. Um, and so we'd love to hear that. And then the most important thing I really have is that we are playing Among Us together tomorrow at, I think it's 10 a.m. Eastern time, maybe 11 a.m., uh, which is an exploration of distrust amongst kernel. I will be very curious who among us um, is the one. I, I haven't played this game yet. I've uh, played uh, Mafia, but it's very similar if you haven't heard of Among Us, and I think there'll be a good crew uh, to end the week. Uh, no surgeries planned, just Among Us for, for Friday for us. So, um, That's more serious than surgery. That's a high-stakes game. <laughs> I, I'm surprised actually that nobody has done a version of Among Us that is played for money on Ethereum. That'd be a great thing to do. Can you imagine that? Yeah, perhaps, perhaps the first uh, first version tomorrow. We'll see. We'll see. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, electronic gaming for reward. You know, it's a great fit if we could just figure out how to make the tech work. Sure. Um, and I, you know, I do think that these lessons, and I it really, I really want to stress this, right? The old cypherpunk mindset was paranoid hostility towards the state, right? And right now we're in a position where we've got 5 million people that just got deplatformed from power who are in massive cultural shock because they've just had their entire world model collapse. You know, the great QAnon void. Eventually some of those people are going to make their way into crypto and start trying to build like paranoid fascist ideology inside of their versions of things like DAOs. Um, so I think it's very important that we do acknowledge the fact that with a trillion dollars of crypto assets, we start to have political responsibilities as a culture and as a community. And part of that involves anti-fascism, both resistance to state violence, but also resistance to fascist insurgency. And, you know, the Ethereum community is far more resistant to that kind of stuff than, for example, the Bitcoiners are. The Bitcoiners will fall into bed with fascism without even blinking, right? But, you know, like, we're not doing this as a rehearsal anymore. You know, we are actually the cyberpunk revolution. This thing is really happening, and we have to take responsibility for it, right? Anyway, last thought. There you go. Thanks, Vinay. Uh, thanks, everyone, for being here. Uh, we'll see you on Slack with some new friends very, very soon. And Vinay, we will definitely have you back for round three uh, at some point. That's good, good. Great time, guys. And we will have the Les Mis movie playing in the background. Beautiful French chorus. Vive la Révolution. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Cheers, everybody. Happy Thursday. Enjoy your day.